Welcome to Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I am James Shore. Every week we take a useful technical skill for software developers, come up with a challenge related to that skill, and then solve it live on stream. And this week it's incremental test-driven development. If you'd like to follow along with the code, it's available on GitHub. You can get it right here, github.com slash jameshore slash livestream. Check out the tag 2020-05-05. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear your your comments in the chat. Uh, I'll address some of them as we go and also have some time at the end if there's any additional questions. Now, uh, test-driven development is red-green refactor, as I think most of us know right by now. It is a series of validated hypotheses. So we're going to go through, we're going to write a little bit of test code, uh, make a prediction about how that test is going to fail, watch it fail, write a little production code, make a prediction about how it's going to pass, watch it pass, refactor, and repeat. Uh, The challenge with test-driven development is taking those small steps. Test-driven development is its at its most effective when you take small steps. But how do you do that? So this week's challenge is to be, we're gonna take a simple algorithm and we're gonna break it down into small steps to use with test-driven development. Specifically, what we're gonna build is a Rote 13 application or algorithm. Uh, Rote 13, you've probably seen it on the internet. It's a simple Caesar cipher where you rotate your letters forward 13 characters. So A becomes N, B becomes O, P becomes, or C becomes P. When you get to Z, you rotate back around to the start of the alphabet. And because the English language has 26 letters, uh, doing it twice gets you exactly back where you started, which is a nice property, which is, I think, why people use it on the internet for spoilers. It's a very simple little algorithm. I think any of us could actually implement it in our sleep. That's not the challenge. The challenge is how do we break this down into small steps so that we can do test-driven development with it effectively? So I'm gonna let you noodle on that for a few minutes. While you think about that, uh, this stream is made possible by the people who hire me for training and consulting. Uh, Folks who want their organizations to become more capable with software development, increase their software development capacity, uh, hire me to do anything from test-driven development training to all the way up to helping their organizations figure out uh, how to organize themselves so they can scale to larger teams, uh, larger groups of teams even. Now, if you would like to join this obviously intelligent uh, group of people with good taste, uh, go ahead and email me, jshore at jamesshore.com. Be happy to set up a free consultation about what I can do for you and your organization. All right, with that out of the way, let's get back to our challenge. We're going to build a ROT13 ROT13 algorithm using small steps and test-driven development. The question is, how do we do that? Well, I like to think of it as eating an onion uh, from the inside out, because problems are like ogres and onions. Uh, They have layers. And down at the juicy core of every problem is something that everything depends on. And if we can find that and build that first, we can do just that little bit of code, build that, and then build the next little piece of code out from there, and the next little piece of code out from there, and the next little piece of code out from there, until we've eaten the whole onion. So the trick with test-driven development is finding the thing that it's at the core of the problem and building gradually out from there. In practice, that tends to look like this. We start out by looking at our core interface. Uh, almost everything depends, starts out by depending on the interface. What is it that we're going to build? How are we going to call it? And we can implement that. We can use the test to figure out what that interface is without actually implementing any algorithm. Once we've done that, we've got our very simple core. We can start building out from there with the initial set of calculations. What's the happy path? What's the most common case that this thing's going to run? And what's the simplest example or piece of that uh, common case? And we'll build that. And then we'll build another little piece, and then another little piece, and then another little piece, and another little piece, until we've got the entire happy path figured out. At that point, we can generalize. We can go a little bit broader. We can look at uh, the cases where maybe we have multiple things going on. And from there, we can uh, look at special cases and air handling. Uh, James, you might have heard of this as zero, one, many. Do the nothing case, do the one case, 
do the many case. Uh, James Grenning calls it zombies, zero, one, many, boundaries, interfaces, exceptions, or errors, and keep it simple. Uh, Bob Martin has his transformation priority premise. And if you download the source code, I've got links to uh, both of their material about, uh, about that material. I, though, I, on the other hand, I think of it as eating the onion from the inside out, but it's basically the same thing. Start simple and then build from there. So let's see what this looks like in practice. Again, if you want to follow along, uh, go to, let's see, go to jameshore.com or github.com slash jameshore slash live stream. Uh, check out the tag 2020-05-05. At the end of the stream, I will take the finished code and I'll upload it using the tag 2020-05-05-n. So if you want to see what the final code looks like, you can do that. Now, if you are following along, there's a couple of scripts here. Uh, you'll need Node.js installed, but everything else is vendored into the repository uh, other than that. Uh, to build the application you're going to use, or to build the code, you're going to use build.sh, or just build on Windows. And uh, that will give you this. And you can also say build quick to only build the things that have changed. And on Mac, but not on Windows, and I'm not sure about Linux, you can use a watch script, which will automatically rerun the build whenever anything changes, and it'll also play a little sound like that, uh, according to whether or not the build succeeded or failed. All right, so we're going to build this Rote 13 algorithm, and we're going to do it step by step. And we're going to find that, we're going to start by finding that sweet, juicy core. Now, Again, at the core of almost every problem is the interface. So that's always the first thing that I start with. How are we going to actually run this code? Now, in, in most languages, in Java and maybe uh, in C Sharp, we'd want to build a class. But we're using JavaScript here. So I think we can actually just build a function. When I think about the Rote 13 encoding, I don't really think of it as being something that requires a class. So for me, I think the algorithm that I want to build here is just wrote 13 dot transform. And because we're focusing on the interface, I want to pass into the transform function something really, really simple. What is the simplest possible example of transforming a string that's still a real string? We're only focusing on the happy path to start with. And when I think about that, I think, well, empty string. That's obviously the simplest possible case. So I'll go ahead and build an assert statement around that. I will transform an empty string to an empty string, and then I'm going to run the tests. Now remember, test-driven development is a series of validated hypotheses. So every time I run the test, I should make a hypothesis. And in this case, my hypothesis is that the tests are going to fail. And they're going to fail because I haven't defined Rote 13 yet. So let's save this and see what happens. It failed. Rote 13 is not defined. Perfect. I'm still in control of what's happening. So, and if it hadn't failed in exactly that way, I wasn't. I wouldn't be in control. And I want to stop and look and say, what, what about my understanding of the system is different than what actually happened? But it did fail the way I expected. So I'm going to require a Rote 13 module. Now this is going to fail because that module doesn't exist. Uh, no, it failed because I spelled it wrong. See? <laughs> now, I make all kinds of mistakes when I'm using test-driven development. Test-driven development doesn't stop me from making mistakes. What it does is it allows me to catch them sooner, and that's why I like it. And it's this series of validated hypotheses that allows me to catch the mistakes. Test-driven development is really just an excuse for constantly checking what's going on with my code. Okay, so now it's failing because the module doesn't exist. I will go ahead and add that. So we'll make a Rote 13 module. Now it's going to fail because uh, transform doesn't exist. Yes, Rote13.transform is not a function. And now it's going to fail because it's going to return undefined. Yes. And now I'm going to make this pass because I'm focused on the interface, not on the algorithm yet, I'm going to make it pass just by hard coding the result. 
And there we go. Now that's, that's kind of a party trick, I'll admit, but I really am focused at this point on just checking the, uh, the very core, which is the interface. By writing this, this actually allows me to validate, is this a good interface? Is this a convenient way of calling the, the thing that I wanna call? And for this simple Rote 13 algorithm, well, yeah, it is. I think this is the right interface and it's pretty comfortable to call. So now we've done red, we've done green, now it's time to refactor. There's obviously not a lot of code here to refactor, but I am gonna come through and update the names of my tests. I'm gonna say that Rote 13 uh, does nothing when empty. Uh, I'm actually not sure when the stream cut off. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jay Walter, for, for letting me know. Now that we've got our interface done, what we want to do is we want to look at what is the next layer. So we want to look at the calculation. And as I'm thinking about how I'm going to implement this, I'm thinking I'm probably going to loop through the, uh, the string one character at a time. Now I could also use something like a regular expression, but I want to keep this simple. But looping through one character at a time and doing all the transformation on each character, that's too big of a step. So as I was saying, we can loop through this one character at a time. Um, but that's too big of a step. So what we need to do is think about what is one piece of this that we can build out. And so doing one character is, is obviously one piece, but even that's too big. We need to focus on just a part of that. So when I think about the core of our Rote 13 app, uh, algorithm, it's transforming a character for, forward 13 letters. So let's go ahead and do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it transforms uh, lowercase letters and let me change something over here so it's a little bit faster and I'm just going to assert that rot13.transform a becomes n and this of course is going to fail because it's returning an empty string right now. Now I could hard code in, but that would be silly. Let's do it for real. So I'm gonna say, if the input is an empty string, we're still gonna to need to return an empty string because we still have that test. We still have that code in place. Um, now we need to actually do the transformation. So I need to take this input and convert the first letter into a char character code. So I'm gonna say that the character code is, and let me look at my cheat sheet here, input.careCode at zero. And that should give me the ASCII code for the first letter of the input. Then I can add 13 to that, and then convert it back into a string and return that string. So we're gonna do that by saying return string drop from char code, char code. And if I've done this right, that should pass. And it does. So that's one small step. Now what we need to do is think, where can we go from here? What's the next little step? Well, as I look at this, this is obviously wrong in so many ways. Uh, it doesn't deal with the fact that we're not supposed to transform numbers. It's not dealing with the fact that uh, in is supposed to go back around to A. So let's choose one of those things that we're obviously not doing yet and do that. And I think since I'm focused on the lowercase letters, I'm gonna go ahead and, and complete that out. I'll do in back around to A. This is gonna fail. It's gonna give us a, a symbol that's off the end of the ASCII alphabet, uh, as, off the end of the alphabet in the ASCII table. And uh, what we can do is we can just say, if the char code is greater than or equal to whatever the character code for n is, then we'll subtract 13 instead. So let's look at our ASCII table. So n is 110. So if it's greater than or equal to 110, we're going to subtract 13. Otherwise, we will add 13. And now that's working. Okay, this is obviously still not good enough. Uh, one thing that's uh, not gonna work here is that 
if we go off, if we're trying to transform uh, non-letters, they are just not going to work. So for example, if I'm saying uh, transform a, a grave symbol, uh, it's going to still add 13 to that. But what we want it to do is actually do nothing. So let's go ahead and take care of that. So again, we're just we starting out with the core case and we're building out from there, just piece by piece by piece. Uh, this is actually still the happy path, but now that we've taken care of the core of, of letters, we're moving on to some other cases as well. Now I could choose to do the uppercase A, but right now I'm still looking at the way I've implemented the lowercase letters and thinking that's obviously insufficient. So I wanna make that better. So I'm gonna say it doesn't transform symbols. So I'll take that grave and say it should still be a grave. And that should fail. Yeah, it's giving us M because it is adding 13 to it. So now what we need to do is we need to say, well, if the character code is greater than the 10, we'll subtract the 13, but else we're only gonna add the 13 if the character code is greater than or equal to A, whatever that is, uh, 97. Now I think this will pass, and it does. Now, every step through the loop, we should be thinking about refactoring. And as I look at this, I don't like that we have magic numbers. So I wanna take those magic numbers and make them more useful. And what I'm thinking here is I could make constants, but I actually think it would be more interesting to say, give me the code for a letter. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna say, I'm going to take an arbitrary letter and turn it into a character code. And now I should be able to say that if our character code is greater than the code for, say, in, that should still pass, and now greater than the code for a. And that should pass. Perfect. Now this is progress, but it's still obviously insufficient. What happens if we, we're, we're not dealing with anything that's under the letter A in this table, but what if we're over the letter N? That's not gonna work either. So let's go ahead and add in the curly brace and say that that should not transform. But I think it will. I think it's gonna end up going back uh, in the alphabet to N, which is exactly what it did. So we need to say that we only subtract 13 if the character code is less than or equal to the code for Z. And, and that should be and, not or. The code, da, 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 da. Oh, and here, so this is interesting. Now we're adding 13 to it. So here I need to do the same thing. There we go. And now we actually have something where I think we're handling most of the cases for a lowercase letter. So now let's go back and think, and, and it's actually pretty clean too. Um, but I think we can refactor it to make it even a little bit better. We're repeating this greater than, uh, less than all over the place. What if we said instead is between, and we took a character code and a first letter and a last letter. And we just basically did this. So we're gonna take this and uh, we'll just replace this with first letter and last letter. And now that we've done that, we should be able to say is between character code in and Z. Now I have to admit, part of the reason I'm doing this is I know we're about to do the uppercase letter. So I'm refactoring to make that a little bit more convenient because I don't want to be typing in, uh, I don't want to be typing in this, these uh, it, long if statements every time.
Okay, that's looking good. And I want to put the plus first just because it feels better to me. All right. So now we've got lowercase letters working and we've got symbols outside of the lowercase letters working. Now let's deal with the uppercase letters. So again, we start with that core and we just sort of uh, truck along dealing with all the special cases that we think of as we write that code. Now I don't think this uh, uppercase is going to work at all because we've excluded everything outside of the range of lowercase letters. So I think what we'll see is we're going to get an A rather than an N. And that's exactly what happens. But this is easily fixed. Uh, we'll just say that if it's between uh, lowercase a and m or if it's between uppercase a and m, add 13. And that should pass. And we'll deal with the lowercase letter case as well. And that fails because we don't have that in here. And now it should pass, and it is. And let's, I'm pretty sure it will work, but let's go ahead and put in a couple of boundary cases too. So we need a square bracket and an at sign. Yep, all good. Okay, so now we've got our core of our algorithm in place. We can do a single letter. Now it's time to uh, advance to doing multiple letters. Now that's obviously going to be just a matter of looping over our algorithm. So what I'm going to do to make this easier, before I write the test, I'm actually going to uh, factor out what I've got. So I'm going to take this and factor it out into a method, or a function in this case. I'm going to call that transform letter. Now I like to, personally, I like to put my, my more general functions first so you can sort of read through it. Uh, some people like to do it opposite, have their more specific functions first. Uh, that's just a matter of taste. Either way is fine, of course. So that should work, it does. Mm -hmm. So now that we've got this, it'll be easy to put a loop around that. So let's write a test to demonstrate that we need to. That's gonna fail because we're not doing a loop. Yeah, we got in instead of NOP, but doing a loop is really easy. It's just a matter of putting a loop around this. So what I'm gonna do is we'll take, we'll say four, let i equals zero, i less than input dot length, i plus plus, We'll need to collect a result, return that result, and accumulate into that result. And that should work. And it did. Perfect. OK, so uh, let's look at this. Any refactorings? I don't think we need this anymore. Uh, this looks pretty clean. This looks clean. Yeah, this is all looking really good, I think. And I think our tests are pretty good as well. What I'm going to do, just for the point, just for the purpose of documentation, I'm actually going to add in uh, the rest of our alphabet here. And that should work. It does, and I'll do the same thing here. And that should work. And I can combine all of these together as well. And while we're at it, although I'm pretty sure it'll work, let's say that we don't transfer numbers uh, just for the sake of documentation. Uh, Charlie Pancakes, thanks for the question. I would be really interested in doing TDD with a purely functional language. I 
have not done that yet, although I do do a lot of programming with Node.js, and it has the capability to be used in a functional way, and I do a lot of functional-like programming with Node.js, but I actually don't use a lot of, uh, of like purely functional languages. I think it would be really interesting to do TDD in that kind of environment, and I don't actually see... I don't see much difference um, because TDD is more of a philosophy of doing the validated hypotheses. The actual details of how it would work would probably be different, but the idea of making a hypothesis, having a way of demonstrating that hypothesis, and then repeating over and over, that I'm pretty sure you can do with anything. Uh, I use it everywhere, not just even in, not even in, just in programming, not even in the computer. Whenever I'm doing something new, I make a prediction, test it, and do it in small steps. And that's really the essence of TDD. So we've got, uh, I think now we've got our happy path completely done. We've got our lowercase letters, our uppercase letters. We're saying that we're not doing any strings. So now it's time to think about the error conditions. What are all the ways that this can go wrong? And one thing that occurs to me is that if you don't pass in a string at all, it's going to fail. And we want it to fail or it should fail. We want it to fail in a nice way. Now, honestly, I don't always test these sorts of conditions because that's obviously a programmer error. They're using the API incorrectly. But sometimes I will, and in this case, I'm going to. So I'm going to say that it fails fast when no parameter provided. And so we'll say that it throws an exception when we call rot13.transform with nothing. And that should say, um, expected string parameter. And that's going to fail saying there is no exception being thrown or maybe a different exception. You know, I think whatever is wrong with my computer has to do with the video driver because this is a little crazy. I think it may be time for me to get a new computer because, wow, this is messed up. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we actually did get an error, cannot read property length of undefined. And that's because presumably uh, input.length right here, but we can code this by just adding a guard clause. So we'll say if input is undefined, then we'll throw a new error, expected string parameter. <laughs> there we go. That's good. And then the other thing that uh, could go wrong is somebody could pass in something that's not a string. So let's say that it fails fast when uh, wrong parameter type. So let's say somebody passes in a number instead of a string. And I'll have the same error come out. That's going to fail, uh, I think, because we're not getting a function. Yeah. So here, I think we'll just do the same thing. If it's undefined or the input is not equal to a string, we'll again throw that error. And there we go. OK, so that's uh, error conditions. Are there any other special cases? Well, one more that comes to mind is Unicode, because uh, we're actually not using ASCII, we're using Unicode. And so there's all kinds of characters that we're not even thinking about. And I think if we were being really clever, we could do transformations of that. But this is a simple little example, so I'm going to keep it simple. I'm just going to say that it doesn't transform um, non-ASCII or non-English letters. So let's say that transforming oh, A, E, I, O, U, and C, and N is going to give me the same thing back. And this is, again, mostly for, partly for the purpose of documentation, because when you're doing test-driven development, you could, of course, throw the tests away. But it's useful to keep them around for regression testing and for documentation. So when I'm writing my tests, I do think 
uh, a lot about how it speaks, how it documents what's going on. Although I admit, I pay more attention to that after I've gotten the algorithm written than, uh, than early on. I think we've now taken care of our special cases, our boundaries. Um, we've taken care of the, the non-English letters. There's one more that comes to mind, which is that in Unicode, not every grapheme is actually a single code point, and not every code point is a single character. So I want to look at uh, what happens with Unicode. So it, I want to say that it doesn't break when given uh, emojis, because emojis are, are in what's called the astral plane of Unicode, and they're actually composed of two Unicode code points back-to-back, uh, -back, at least in UTF. Uh, UTF-16 and UTF-8. Now, I'm pretty sure this is going to work because those, the way you get to the astral plane is outside of the ASCII bounds that we're in, but I still want to document it and test it just to make sure. So let's go ahead and grab some, uh, some Unicode. My screen is not working properly, but it looks like I can still randomly choose some. There we go. See, that one was weird. Let's grab these and we'll assert that they don't change. Oh, and I need to put the parenthesis here. There we go. Great. Uh, so I think that's... Um, I think that's it. That's eating the onion from the inside out. We start out with the interface, we build the core happy path, we build all the variants of the happy path until we finish that, and then we add on loops and generalization, and we finally finish off with special cases and air conditions. Uh, I'm happy to take more questions if you all have any. Uh, my streaming software is messed up, so I'm going to stay in this view right now. But if you'd like to ask more questions, uh, I'd love to take them. Uh, as you're thinking about that, I'm gonna. I have a few announcements. Uh, first off, uh, next week's lunch and learn is going to be at the same time, Tuesday at noon. I'm gonna do a little bit of more work on my stream and see if I can figure out what the problems with the stream are. Uh, that lunch and learn is going to be about integration testing. So how do you test code that talks to the outside world? Uh, so that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be looking at. I think what we're going to be doing is looking at code that writes to the console, uh, but it's actually going to be uh, generalizable to all sorts of code that talks to the outside world. And we'll be looking, and future streams, we'll also be looking at how do you test services and uh, doing a lot of really good stuff about dealing with infrastructure. Before next Tuesday's stream, though, this Friday is Casual Coding Friday. I'm going to be live coding an extended example of uh, eating the onion, uh, build, you know, doing this inside out. Uh, I'm going to be doing an extended example of that from 11 to 1 Pacific time. So that starts an hour earlier than this one did for those of you in a different time zone. So again, uh, and that one's unscripted. It's got a relaxed pace. And if you want to see more examples or a more complicated example, or if you just want to hang out and chat, uh, come on by. That's Friday at 11 Pacific, uh, Casual Coding Friday. Or the next uh, Lunch and Learn is going to be on Tuesday at noon Pacific, uh, same time as this one or an hour earlier on Friday. And remember, if you liked what you saw today and you want more customized to your situation uh, and at your pace, I do provide uh, remote training for people and other sorts of agile consulting uh, focused on companies that I really specialize in companies that have low bureaucracy organizations that are interested in taking advantage of their agility. Uh, so let's uh, take some questions. Info4R asks, uh, would you refactor tests Absolutely, I refactor tests. I think it's really important to refactor your tests, in fact. Uh, you didn't see a lot of that in this case because the tests were so simple. But uh, as I said, tests should be documentation. So you constantly want to be looking at uh, how well are your tests speaking to that documentation. Uh, you'll notice that as I was working, I would sometimes modify existing tests rather than adding new tests. And again, that's because I want the test to tell a story and to speak clearly. Um, uh, Info4R also asks, uh, would you consider a parameterized tests or property-based tests? I have done that in the past. Uh, the particular testing framework I'm using here, which is Mocha, doesn't support it, or at least it didn't last time I checked. Uh, but I will uh, write tests that 
basically use helper methods uh, to do something. So I might say something like uh, assert no transformation like this. Let's see. And um, that, of course, would require us to write a function. We'll transform the input into the input. And that should pass. And it does. And so I could do the same thing here. And this, uh, I didn't do this in this stream, but this is the kind of thing I will very frequently do, especially if I've got a complicated setup or something like that. I these days I tend to prefer not to use setup blocks because I think they make the tests a little harder to reason about. So let's go ahead and finish this one. Uh, Charlie Pancakes, thanks for the comment. Uh, Pellet says, um, when do you feel it's appropriate to generate more exhaustive test cases uh, than not? I generally don't do exhaustive test cases. When I'm writing my test, doing test-driven development, this is not, it's not really about doing testing in the formal testing sense. What it is, what's it about is about uh, really two things. It's about that series of validated hypotheses. So I'm going to focus my tests on whatever gets me to the next step forward in my production code. And then as I get closer, I'm going to be thinking about how well does this document my interface for other programmers. So I'm not going to do, I'm not generally going to do exhaustive testing uh, just for the sake of doing exhaustive testing. Uh, if I'm concerned about the quality of my tests or my code, I will use exploratory testing or I might use a mutation testing, which is randomly modifying your code and then seeing if your tests break. Or I might do a separate set of exhaustive testing there. But for test-driven development, I don't do a lot of exhaustive testing. Now you do see it here, but I did that again more as for, for documentation and also in this case because it was easy. And uh, it did get me my edge cases around A and M and N and Z. But it's not usually something that I'll do. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. So that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you all for watching. Uh, again, I like to keep this short and fast. Um, our next stream, again, is going to be on uh, Friday. Casual Coding Friday starts an hour earlier at 11 a.m. Pacific. And then our next Lunch and Learn is going to be on Tuesday at noon. And we're going to be looking at integrating with the outside world and doing integration testing of that. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Sorry about the issues with the stream. I, I think it's time for me to buy a new computer, and I do see that Apple has finally brought out the new version of the MacBook Pro with a 13-inch screen and the new keyboard, which is what I've been waiting for. So um, I might be getting a new keyboard soon, <laughs> or new Mac soon, and hopefully that will solve the problems. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you all coming along. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Uh, if you have suggestions of what you'd like to see in future streams, I'd love to hear it. Uh, that's it for me. I am going to sign off. Unfortunately, the interface for my streaming software has disappeared, so I'm going to have to try to find the exit button. Let's see.